Hi, it's Dwyer, GamblersAdvisory.com, BettingAngle.us, both free sites. It is July the 3rd. I got a little carried away on my last video and forgot to talk about the subject matter that I wanted to discuss. Let's talk boxing, but first remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, right now, you have a problem in the super middleweight division. You know guys aren't fighting each other just by the number of unbeaten champions out there, right? It's as if the idea of a unification fight is too upsetting to people or something. So, Khaled Plant, unbeaten. Callum Smith, unbeaten. Billy Joe Saunders, unbeaten. David Benavides, unbeaten. Guys, it's time to start fighting each other. Give us the big fights. Get the big paydays. Hopefully COVID will pass so we can get back to the sport at hand. Folks, you need to fight each other. Well, let's talk about great super middleweights of an earlier era that, quite frankly, had some of the same problems. Understand. They don't go away. Even 20 to 25 years later. Right? In my favorites folder right now is one of the best boxing roundtables I have ever seen. And there's a backstory to many of the fighters at the roundtable. It's called The Gloves Are Off. It's hosted by former cruiserweight champion Johnny Nelson. Right, by the way, Nelson at the end of the show turns to Roy Jones and says, I would have kicked your ass. <laughs> and Roy Jones looks away in disgust as if to say, you've got to be kidding me. It's very good at the round table. Is Chris Eubank, Steve Collins, who beat him twice, Roy Jones, Johnny Nelson, Joe Calzaghe, Richie Woodall. Right now, understand, a lot of these fighters were big in the 1990s. But here's the backstory. Right? Chris Eubank fought Nigel Benn. By the way, at the beginning of the telecast, they point out that Benn couldn't make it. Chris Eubank fought Nigel Benn before huge crowds. Understand, 30 years ago, the super middleweight division was huge, right? Action was taking place on both halves of the Atlantic. There were several great fighters, right? Chris Eubank fought Nigel Benn. They were big fights. So at this round table, they asked Roy Jones Jr., and understand, there's a stretch in the 1990s where Roy Jones is really almost unchallenged as the best in the sport pound for pound. Right? He beats Mike McCallum, for example. And McCallum, of course, had beaten Stevie Collins. Right? He beats Virgil Hill, who's also a Hall of Famer. He destroys Vinny Pazienza. He beats James Tony when James Tony was unbeaten. Right? Jones was big. But yet Jones never crossed the Atlantic, even though there was an active market there for super middleweights. So Jones is asked why he never crossed the Atlantic. He's even challenged by Stevie Collins on the telecast. Understand, these wounds last for decades. He's even challenged by Stevie Collins, who fought on both halves of the Atlantic. Why Jones never fought him? And Jones's responses are weak. He's talking about writing a letter. He's talking about, you know, the negotiators couldn't work it out. Promoters tried to exploit him. Right? Let's understand economics. Had Jones gone to the UK to fight a Chris Eubank, the fight would have been huge. Huge. 
right? It would have enhanced the winner's legacy, whoever that winner was. But Jones didn't do that. So Jones is left looking like Floyd Mayweather today, where a critic will say, you know what? People came to you. You didn't go to them. Mayweather, of course, seemed to be tethered to the city of Las Vegas. Right? Let's just say even a fighter like Jones, who many consider the pound-for-pound -pound king for several years in the 90s. I'm telling you, Jones puts together a run that, to me, is historical. I'm not sure if I've seen a fighter on a better run than Jones when he mowed down Mike McCallum, for example, right? Jones was simply too fast for even great fighters. He makes James Tony look plotting, right? But understand, the fact that Jones didn't travel in a sport where an Ali fought in the UK, fought in Africa, fought in the Philippines, right? In that sport, Roy Jones comes across as a bit local on the telecast. Well, let me just tell you how crazy the sit-down is, how you could tell that some guys still have grudges, both on fights that happened and fights that didn't happen. Stevie Collins calls out Roy Jones. He wants to fight Roy Jones now. Folks, Stevie Collins is 55 years old. <laughs> 55 years old. At one point, Colin says, hey, I've been medically cleared, right? He's 55 years old. Let's just say I've seen boxing commissions stop some older fighters from fighting. But Stevie Collins feels he was robbed of fighting Roy Jones. So then, of course, into the conversation, and again, the video's in my favorites folder, steps Chris Eubank, because understand there's something about Steve Collins' background that has troubled a lot of boxing people. There was an unbeaten Welsh fighter who was just coming up, Joe Calzaghi. Who's there at the table? Calzaghi, of course, drops Chris Eubank in the first round of their fight, then goes on to beat him. And at the time, Calzaghi was supposed to be unproven. Eubank on the telecast said, look, you know, I looked at films before the fight. I thought, you know... Joe doesn't look like he punches that hard. Then when I was in the ring with him, the punches stung. They hurt. Well, understand, Steve Collins twice was supposed to fight Joe Calzaghi. Right? Steve Collins retires twice. I'm not kidding. He claims that his eyes were on Roy Jones. When he couldn't get a fight with Roy Jones, he was demoralized. He moved on. Then, of course, he comes back. They order him to fight Joe Calzaghi. He claims he hurt his foot. So, of course, the fight was called off. So, of course, he never fights again. Folks, that sounds wishy-washy. Let's say that hurts his credibility. You're at a table with your peers. You're calling out Roy Jones, but yet you haven't fought. Joe Calzaghi, you had a chance, multiple chances, to fight Joe Calzaghi in his prime. And you didn't do that. Right? The show is also noteworthy. By the way, Richie Woodall seems to be the best adjusted. He's sitting there, and he obviously showed up thinking this was going to be a career appreciation, old-timers, fellas get together and have a few laughs type of meeting. He wasn't expecting it to be so tense, right? You can tell the guys are trying to look jovial, but what they're saying is heavy. So Chris Eubank at one point felt the need to say to Steve Collins, and keep in mind, Collins beats him twice. He says to Steve Collins, yeah, you know, the first time I fought you, I just couldn't imagine you beating me, <laughs> right? In other words, he's throwing daggers at Steve, right? He said, but you obviously were cagey. You figured out my style, right? So then Collins, you know, Eubank at one point says, this man was prepared to die in the ring against me. To which Collins responds, no, I wasn't. 
So they asked Collins why he didn't fight Eubank later. And Collins says, look, after Eubank went up to Cruiserweight and fought Carl Edwards, I think that's his name, um, Collins thought Eubank was a shop-worn fighter. Literally says so on the show. Right? I thought the show was fascinating. There's even a ghost that haunts the show that's unexpected. At one point, Collins, who seemed to be controlling the conversation. Collins at one point says that, you know, arguably the most talented guy he saw back then was James Lights Out Tony. Now, ego is very important to professional athletes. You know, they tell you, don't have two starting NFL quarterbacks in the interview room at the same time. Right? Ego gets the best of us. Roy Jones loses it on the show. At the mention of Tony, he says, how could Tony be better than all of us when I beat Tony? He goes further. He says, look, I could have been playing checkers and I would have beaten Tony. <laughs> right? So, people laugh and stuff. But understand, as Roy Jones is there talking about how he wanted to duplicate Bob Fitzsimmons' record and win the heavyweight title and stuff like that. Understand, James Tony did that. Got stripped of a heavyweight title because he failed a PED test. Also understand, as great as the fighters were seated around that table, right, as great as they were, an argument can be made that James Tony beat the most daunting opponent. Because Tony fought Evander Holyfield at heavyweight. And Tony stops him. Doesn't win a decision. Wins by stoppage. Right, wins by stoppage. Now I know some of you, and I have a very boxing hardcore crowd here, are going to say, hey, Roy Jones beat John Ruiz. Right? Didn't John Ruiz once beat Evander Holyfield? I'll agree with that, but I would say we're not going to confuse John Ruiz's career with Evanda Holyfield's career, are we? Holyfield's a man who beat Tyson twice. Right? Holyfield's a man who beat Riddick Bowe, goes the distance twice with Lennox Lewis. Right? Well, just understand, inadvertently, he's not even, you know, there. Inadvertently. James Tony gets the highest compliments possible on the telecast, right? Steve Collins basically talks about how Tony was just gifted. Now, Johnny Nelson makes the claim, and it's dubious, that there were guys at Nelson's gym who were more gifted than James Tony, but they, did, they didn't have the approach, the mental fortitude to make it work, right? But understand, as you're sitting at the table, you realize that a defensive technician... That's who Collins was. Like Stevie Collins understood that in the pocket, Tony, a, the consummate counterpuncher, had few peers. Right? Also, it's interesting that Collins, even today, wants to fight Roy Jones. He sees things on tape that he feels he can exploit. Right? Understand, Chris Eubank is on the show talking about how well-prepared Collins was for him. And if you look at the two Collins-Eubank fights, you're going to notice that Collins fights two different fights. He wins the first time. The second time, he has a different style that catches Eubank by surprise. Right? So it's fascinating. So then, of course, you have Joe Calzaghe. And understand, while Eubank is there, almost disrespecting Steve Collins to his face, saying, hey, I don't know how you beat me, basically. He has nothing but the utmost respect for Joe Calzaghe. In other words, Calzaghe has the extra glow, even as he sits with his peers. You realize, too, that the claim that Calzaghe didn't take on the biggest fighters is ridiculous. Because, of course, Stevie Collins backs out of fighting Calzaghe twice.
Calzaghe fought Chris Eubank, who's there at the table. Calzaghe fought Roy Jones, who's there at the table. Calzaghe talks about how he started to lose interest in the sport after he beats Mikel Kessler, but we know, in addition to fighting Jones, he fights Bernard Hopkins, who, of course, was still championship level. Bernard continues fighting for years after he fights Joe Calzaghe. Right, so let's just say it's a fascinating, fascinating sit-down. The guys talk about what could have been, right? Roy Jones in the UK. Right? Stevie Collins fighting Roy Jones. You also have an interesting point of view. They ask Chris Eubank, whose catchphrase back in the day was simply the best. <laughs> That's what he entered the ring to, simply the best. They ask him why he didn't fight Roy Jones. And he discloses that he talked with Roy way back in the day about how, you know, it would be an absolute war if the two of them fought. But Eubank says, you know, my goal was never to be the very best. It's a shocking admission on the show. He says, my goal was to be one of the best. Right? He claims that had he fought Roy Jones... They would have depleted each other to such an extent that they wouldn't have been able to have continued on to the rest of their careers. Right? And so it's really a riveting roundtable. It's not the roundtable I expected. Right? It, it, it's truly interesting and it's clear too that the guys still hold grudges. Right? Jones thinks he's the best, but of course, Jones didn't fight. Eubank, he didn't fight Collins. Right? He was past his expiration date when he fought Calzaghe. Right? Stevie Collins is interesting because Collins, different fight style than a Joe Calzaghe, for example. But at the same time, Collins didn't hit the public imagination until he was in his 30s. So you wonder what would have happened since young Calzaghe had blinding hand speed. You wonder how an older fighter who relied on defense and moves would have done against a very high volume, very fast, Joe Calzaghe. Right? Also, there's a moment in the show where Roy Jones starts addressing Calzaghe's unbeaten record. And Jones says, look, they took my unbeaten record from me. He said, I was disqualified against Montel Griffin. So he talks about how it changed his career. His goal was to retire unbeaten. But then he decided, you know what, I'm going to be Bob Fitzsimmons. Right, legendary figure who won different titles in different weight classes before the weight classes got splintered. So Jones talks about how it was his mission to go to the heavyweight division. Now I don't say this lightly, and I know many here online disagree with me. One of Jones's biggest mistakes, when you go up in weight, it's very hard, very hard. For a fighter who's 30 or so to then go back down in weight. Right? So once Roy Jones, and he was the baddest man on the planet, at the time he goes up to the heavyweight division, once Roy Jones made the decision to go to the heavyweight division, he should have been like Michael Spinks. Why is Jones talking so much about Bob Fitzsimmons? He should be mentioning Michael Spinks, who jumped from light heavyweight to take out a dominant, granted a little bit older, but a dominant Larry Holmes, who had been heavyweight champ for several years. Well, once Spinks enters the heavyweight division, Spinks understood, I can't lose the weight to get back down to 175 comfortably. Now, had Roy Jones, and this is a legacy thing, 
right? For any, any young person watching this video, this is a legacy thing. Understand, Roy Jones is bulletproof. Even after the Montel Griffin DQ, he beats Montel in the rematch. He's viewed as the best fighter pound for pound. He jumps up to the heavyweight division. He beats the heavyweight champ. Now, had Roy Jones, like Mike, Michael Spinks, stayed at heavyweight, I believe whatever happened, he would be viewed as one of the greatest fighters ever. Right? Had he gone out and taken on a big heavyweight and gotten blown out, we would have forgiven him. We would have said, look, this is like Ray Robinson jumping up to light heavyweight. Right? Roy is clearly small by Vladimir Klitschko era standards for the heavyweight division. This was the best man in the world pound for pound. He jumps up to heavyweight. He's not a heavyweight. He lost to a bigger man. Okay, so it goes. Had Roy won at heavyweight. Keep in mind, Michael Spinks destroys, stops Jerry Cooney. Had Roy won at heavyweight, my God. I mean, that would be it. You understand, he wouldn't have to, you know, linger at heavyweight. At that point, he could retire heavyweight champion. Had Roy announced his retirement after beating Ruiz, we'd be remembering him as one of the absolute best ever in the sport. Instead, Roy lost the weight. His career has been a bit of a carnival show ever since. He loses to Tarver, stoppage. He loses to Glenn Johnson. That's a bad stoppage. Right since then, Roy Jones has been more name than big time talent and the problem with lingering in the sport. Basketball fans know this, who watched Kareem Abdul-Jabbar the last few years, is people start to forget how dominant you were. Right, they are do. I don't think we remember today, Roy Jones, the way we did when he wins the heavyweight title. Right, well, let me just say, so this show is filled with what ifs, right? The gloves are off show. What if Steve Collins had fought Roy Jones? What if Collins had fought Joe Calzaghe? We just don't know. Understand, Collins wants to fight today. The wisest man in the room seems to be Richie Woodall, who basically says, hey, I had a career that exceeded my expectations. I was glad to be champion. Woodall lost to Roy Jones, right, back in the day. And Woodall basically says, look, you know, you have to be ready to take the punches. He's basically saying to Steve Collins on the telecast, he says, look, you might be in great shape, right? Unsaid is great shape for 55-year-old. But are you ready to take the punches? And Woodall basically says, look, once you walk away from the sport, once you leave the battlefield, it's hard to get back on it, right? Also, it's interesting. Johnny Nelson asked Roy Jones, why are you continuing on, right? Implicit in the question is, hey, Roy, you're no longer Roy Jones. Not only that, if you want to see a devastating knockout of Roy Jones, Look at the Denis Lebedev KO of Roy Jones in their fight for Moscow. I, I got to tell you, there's a moment there where you were wondering if Roy was ever going to open his eyes again. Right? And so the guys around the table, and keep in mind, some of these guys have been retired for years. <laughs> right? For years. And they're around Roy's age. The guys at the table are saying, Roy, why are you continuing? And Roy basically just says, look, I, I need the challenges. Roy goes further and says that he wants a title at Cruiserweight. Right, folks, it's a cringeworthy moment. So let me give my highest rating to the gloves are off. It's an interesting personality study. 
Chris Eubank clearly still feels that he's a better fighter than Steve Collins. Steve Collins feels that he would have beaten Roy Jones in the 90s. Right? Roy Jones is upset that people are mentioning James Tony's name <laughs> as one of the all-time greats, even though, let's face it, it's not just Evander Holyfield who Tony beat. Tony beat Giroff. People need to look up that fight. That's a masterpiece Tony fight. Understand, too, Tony beats a fighter history seems to have forgotten who's one of the best fighters I ever saw in my life. And he beat him in his backyard. Michael Nunn. Right? Nunn's catchphrase back in the day was second to none. Right? Tony beat him, and of course, Tony beat Mike McCallum. Right? Think about it. And you could tell Roy Jones is upset when people mention Tony's name. It's clear that Jones wants the world to feel that he's singular. And he doesn't want Tony to get the recognition for all the work Tony put in. I agree. Roy Jones beat Tony rather handily when the two of them fought. Tony could not handle Jones's hand speed. But it's clear to Stevie Collins, who's on the show. In fact, I believe it's clear to several people at the table that James Tony is clearly a Hall of Fame talent. That's clear. He beats Evander Holyfield so soundly, after that fight, people started talking about Evander having a hole in his heart. Right? That's before Evander goes on to several years of his career. Right? Let me also add the obvious. Tony, of course, never fights Chris Eubank. Never fights Joe Calzaghe. Never fights Steve Collins. Right? So... To today's current crop at 168, the group that's all undefeated, right? Guys, don't have regrets 20 years from now, right? Start fighting each other. Grab Canelo and say, let's go. If the promoters get in the way and there's talk and stuff like that, don't have this unfold like Wilder Joshua where both camps are claiming the other camp prevented the fight from being made, right? Don't end up on a show like this 20, 25 years from now, feeling that you would have beaten a guy who was a contemporary, who you never fought. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this video. The show is called The Gloves Are Off, and it's in my favorites folder here on YouTube. YouTube.com slash DWYER 70905. Thanks for stopping by.